We're out in the shop on a cold winter day, getting ready to talk about winter gear and tips. So you're gonna have to excuse the mess. Um, this is a working shop, but I got motivated to do this video from watching prominent YouTubers. These are guys that have hundreds of hiking videos under their belt and thousands and thousands of subscribers. And there was a lot of winter hiking tips and information that I have that I felt like was missing from those videos. Um, so I'm going to try to combine all that winter hiking gold into one video that I don't believe is on any other platform on YouTube. So anytime I got an idea that's novel and nobody else is covering it, I'm definitely doing a video on that. Here we go. The first thing we're going to talk about is food and cooking. So you're looking at my entire cook kit. I should say that this video is for lightweight backpackers um, with a little experience. So if you're new to backpacking, you probably shouldn't be setting out in the winter for um, one of your first trips because you're just going to be sad. But for you guys that are a little more advanced, um, let's get right into it. Here's a isobutol, isobutane canister for my canister stove and my cook kit looks like this got a thousand milliliter pot I would definitely recommend a thousand milliliter or larger for winter camping because you're gonna be needing to melt snow and cook bigger meals um, so your summer small uh, summer small pots aren't gonna cut it and then I got my I think it's a BRS 2000 or whatever this is my um, stove so you guys probably recognize this from summer camping. Um, winter camping tip number one that I did not see in any other videos is that your canister stove is probably not going to work in the winter. So the problem is that all canister stoves even the winter mixes are generally a propane butane combination and the propane works in the winter but the butane will not gasify below a certain temperature so if you're out there camping I would say below 20 degrees um, your propane will initially light your stove and it'll run for a while on propane but once that propane is gone and that's only a small percentage of this mixture um, you're still gonna have a relatively full canister and it's not gonna work anymore um, so winter hack for the stove to make it work in really, really cold conditions, this cheap lightweight BRS stove is going to work below zero. And all I did was I got a silicone wristband. Don't use rubber. Make sure you get a silicone one that'll fit on the uh, bigger, bigger canisters. Also, um, you put that around the bottom of your canister. I cut a piece of, um, copper flashing to fit just like that so the concept here is that when you light this stove up let's do it now that flame licks that piece of copper which in turn transfers the heat from the propane that's burning right now down to the canister and that will enable the butane to gasify. So now your uh, winter mix stove with propane and butane in it will work down into temperatures that it shouldn't. And you still have, are able to bring a super lightweight rig as opposed to, you know, a uh, white gas stove or some of these super heavy uh, winter rigs that people are cooking with. That's tip number one that I didn't see anywhere else. And don't forget that you're going to use more fuel for your stove in the winter. So the temperatures that your water is starting out with are much colder um, than they are in the summer. So I would probably double whatever your planned fuel pack out is. All right, we're still in the cook kit talking about 
my setup. So you can see I also have something else here. If I unpackage that, you're going to find that it is a Bush Buddy twig stove. So I bring this uh, all the time, winter camping. Uh, it's a favorite for me. Um, I enjoy cooking over it. That's just, uh, you know, a little bush crafty and I get a kick out of it. But how does it apply to uh, winter hiking in a way that's significant and maybe nobody else is talking about? So if you're looking at these two items here, um, these are not just cooking implements, but they're also heat sources. So you have to look at it like that. So... Oh, and I should talk about alcohol stoves real quick because that's like the third kind of cooking implement that you could use in the field. So you got a twig stove, um, isobutyl, white gas, and alcohol. Um, I tried alcohol, uh, suboptimal for winter conditions. I'm just going to leave it at that. You're going you're gonna to be using up way too much fuel, and it's just finicky. Um, I would avoid alcohol stoves for the winter. But tip number two for winter camping is going to be a um, hack to stay warm when you catch a chill. And I've used this a few times on the trail, and it is extremely effective. So we're going to get into that now. All right, so I've used this trick um, a few times, and primarily when I use it is when I'm not hiking. I've stopped, and I'm taking a break, or it's the beginning or the end of the day, and I catch a chill, and I'm having a hard time breaking that chill. Um, especially before I get into my sleeping bag, I need to warm up. So if I have my twig stove running or I brought my isobutol canister stove and if you're like me and you hike with a poncho, this is going to look really crazy, but bear with me. So it's called a polymer furnace and it works. So the concept is, give me a second here. You're going to put your poncho on. Cover up your body. You're going to be sitting down, preferably on a um, foam pad or something to keep that conductive heat loss from occurring. You want to get that poncho spread out over your entire body. And then you're going to tuck down inside this poncho so you can see what you're doing and light, this, light that little um, propane burner in between your legs. So I'm sitting Indian style. I don't know if you could see it on the video, but basically, you got to be careful. I mean, you don't want your flame blasting out of here, so you're going to shrink wrap yourself with your poncho. You just want a real low flame. Just dial it down. Put it between your legs. Pull that poncho over. So, and then tuck your arms into your poncho. And I mean, you could use a plastic uh, trash bag you know, you're using for your pack liner, uh, whatever you got. But basically, this is going to create a micro environment inside of this poncho. And I can feel it already. It is just warming up. And after about three minutes, it's going to be like a sauna inside of this thing. And it's going to break that chill. Um, you're going to be able to warm up anywhere in the field. I mean, I could sit down up against a tree in a blizzard and do this. And it's going to create an 80 degree, 90 degree little sauna inside of this poncho that's going to warm me up. So that's tip number two for winter backpacking. And, um, you know, just make sure that you cinch that neck down tight so that you're not getting fumed by your um, canister stove. Right? Or you can take the, uh, take the hood... Open it up, cinch it up around your neck. Now you don't have any problems. But man, it's already, I'm starting to sweat just sitting here. So just that little tiny, almost like a candle flame coming off of this stove. That's all you need. 
All right, that covers the equipment that I use for trail cooking. Um, I guess we should talk about trail food real quick. Uh, for breakfast and lunch, I prefer like granola or breakfast bars, uh, power bars, gorp, um, anything that I don't have to cook. It's got a high caloric value and I could just shove it in my mouth and move on. Um, you just don't want to be dawdling in the winter. I mean, it's hard to even stop for breaks if I'm being honest about it because as soon as you start sitting around, even if you throw your puffy on, you're going to get chilled pretty quickly. And um, I cannot overemphasize um, how dangerous it can be. I mean, and you're, you're most at danger like in the morning when you're packing up um, and at night when you're setting up and, and, and when you stop for a break. Um, that is when your body stops producing heat from hiking and you can get in trouble real quick. So uh, ready to ready to go meals are really the way to go. That way there if it's raining or you know extremely cold or whatever, you don't have to be fussing with um, boiling water and clean up and all that stuff. You just shove that food in your mouth. I actually keep my lunch in my hip pockets uh, of my backpack while I'm backpacking. I just reach in there and grab a bite anytime, you know, and I don't even eat a dedicated lunch. I'll just eat a granola bar like every two hours or whatever. And that keeps me fueled up throughout the day. Um, as far as dinner, um, the mountain house meals or, you know, anything of those dehydrated package meals, those things are great. If you can afford that, do that. If not, um, Idaho and mashed potato based meals uh, worked best for me because they were very quick to cook. And they were very calorie dense, so um, I went with a lot of that. I'm actually almost fatigued on um, Idaho and potatoes at this point. But moving on with the video. And I should talk about your headlamp, too. Um, don't forget your days are going to be much shorter in the winter than they are in the summer. So you're going to have to consolidate that hiking day down or do some night hiking. Um, don't chintz on the headlamp. Um, you know, get a good one. I got the Nightcore NU20. That thing's worked great for me. Um, but, you know, also the cold weather is harder on batteries, so they're going to shorten your battery life. So you want to get a pretty substantial headlamp for winter, winter backpacking. Don't overlook that. We're talking about a sleep system now. So I operate it from, I don't know, 40s down to zero. Most of the nights I think we're um, low 20s, teens. So this is the setup I used, and it worked great. Um, zero complaints, and I would do it again. So it took me a little bit to dial in here, but this is the end product, and we'll go over it now. Uh, the first hack I got for you is my Gossamer Gear Pack. It has a sit pad built into the back of it. I actually uh, fabbed this sit, sit pad myself from a uh, Thermarest rig rest pad. Um, but most of you guys are hiking and camping with a sit pad. And let me tell you something. If you're going out in the winter, this thing's a necessity because you cannot sit down on um, anything without a, a, a massive amount of conductive heat loss. So you need to insulate your butt and um, even your feet. If your feet are going to be on the ground for a while and you're stationary, you need something under your feet. So... What I would do with this sit pad when I got into camp at the end of the day and I'm getting ready to go to sleep is I would slide it under my core so it gave my sleeping pad a little bit of an R value bump and it also protected my inflatable sleep pad in its most vulnerable area where I'm the heaviest and I'm flopping around and grinding the most and that's uh, right in this area here. So that's my sit pad. The um, Inflatable pad itself is a Neo Air X Therm, and um, I love it. They work great. Um, I can tell you that I didn't experience any cold from the ground coming through with this setup. Um, it kept me warm all the way down to zero. Uh, here's hack number two that you might not know. Your Neo Air X Therm comes with a pump sack. So Neo Air recommends that you use this, especially in the winter. Because you don't want to be injecting your moisture from your lungs into your um, 
sleeping pad because that's going to damage the pad. It'll crystallize, ice crystallize in there. It'll damage the pad and it'll also reduce its efficacy um, with keeping you warm. So I just use mine as my clothes bag. And at night I would dump all the clothes out and use it to pump up my sleeping pad. Work great for that. Um, starting at the bottom. I got these uh, enlightened equipment uh, Apex Torrid or Apex booties. So these are um, insulated sleep booties. And they work good um, to keep my feet warm. And I picked these because they were actually lighter than wool socks, but kind of had the same R value. And they're nice and loose and comfortable, which is nice at the end of the day. Um, even if it wasn't all that cold out, I would wear these just to keep the inside of my sleeping bag from getting gross. But those work very well. Um, some of you guys that want to wear thick wool socks to sleep, that's fine. I get it. Um, these were my wool socks here. They are the uh, Darn Tough Mountaineering over to calf socks. These things work phenomenal. They kept my feet uh, from any kind of cold injuries in all my winter hiking. I've never had foot cold injuries and I've done some crazy stuff. I'm talking about like trail runners, uh, eight hours on the trail through five inches of slush ice water, uh, just wearing these socks and trail runners, and my feet were fine. So I swear by these things. But the, the downfall to them um, is that they kind of have a compression sock fit. So um, that keeps you from getting blisters while you're hiking, but um, it gets a little bit, it, it's too much pressure too so much squeeze on your calves and your feet while you're sleeping. So um, if you wear these for days at a time, you're going to find it starting to really be obnoxious to you. And it's going to start leaving imprints in your calves and everything. You want to get them off. So uh, choose a looser fitting sock um, for sleeping if you're going to go that route. Um, I did wear the uh, Mara wool. This is a 250 weight merino wool sleep. Uh, or it's just long johns, basically. Um, that's what I wore to bed. That worked great. I would recommend uh, merino wool for base layer because it does not retain stink. There's something about it that, um, on a biological level, it destroys bacteria. So um, it's nice to not smell yourself when you're in your sleeping bag. And then it's uh, incredibly warm and comfortable. So I went with that. Um, and then if I got colder, the weather was colder, I could throw on my mid-layer, which was this, uh, right here, this merino wool mid-layer. You don't need merino wool for a mid-layer. You could just use um, polyester fleece. It's cheaper. You don't have to worry about it stinking because it's a mid-layer. You're not going to be sweating on it. Um, and the fleece is lighter and probably uh, warmer, in my opinion, than the merino wool when you're static controversial but anyway um, the nice thing about that though is it had that chest pocket and I had to use that every single night when I got into bed um, my water filter would go in there and if you leave that out it's gonna freeze and it's gonna uh, it's gonna be compromised it's not gonna work anymore as a filter once it freezes so I'd have to sleep with that pressed up against my body and then all my electronics including the camera that I'm filming this on, had to go into my sleeping bag with me every night. And you had to be very methodical about your routine because if you made a mistake, um, something was you know, not going to work the next day or you're going to be in some trouble. So I had to be very mindful about what I was doing every night, where all my kit was going with me in the sleeping bag, but that's everything that went into my sleeping bag. And then here's my uh, balaclava. This is really key. Because you need something to pre-warm that air that you're breathing. Um, if it's zero degrees out, you can't just be injecting zero degree air into your lungs because uh, that's going to cool your whole. It's going to cool your whole core off. And I mean, there, there, I've been out quite a few times where I've actually had the snot inside my nose freeze. So sometimes, you, when it gets colder out, you got to pre-warm that air, and that's you know you need your mouth inside of this, and that's. What you got to do, it gets a little uncomfortable because your condensation is going to build up. That's why I recommend um, polyester or some type of um, flash drying material for, for your um, balaclava because it's going to get wet. But you have to have it. Um, and it's also nice to add some supplemental warmth to your neck. 
your cheeks, you know, your nose, all that stuff that's hanging out there, even though you got your hood up on your sleeping bag. Uh, here's a Seat of Summit pillow, worked fine, no problems, no cold weather issues with that. Um, what I can add is there's been a couple of nights where I'm in my sleeping bag and I can't get warm. I catch a chill, sitting in there for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, just cold, can't warm up. That's where having these, hand, these hot hands hand warmers makes a huge difference. Um, I'll, I'll break one open, throw it right down in my crotch, and the other one I'll, I'll tuck into a sock, and that will break a chill. And it's got me through where, you know, I've been out there in zero degree weather. My sleeping bag's only rated for zero, and I was toasty. And that's, that's really what got me through. It made the difference. Um, speaking of sleeping bags, let's get to that now. All right, there's my bag. Before I get into that, I forgot one more vital piece of uh, winter sleeping gear, and that is some foam earplugs. So, a lot of times in the winter, there's high winds, and those winds are going to be flapping that tarp in front of your shelter, or they're going to be flapping your tent like crazy, which is going to make a ridiculous amount of noise. There's going to be trees snapping and popping and just wind howling, all kinds of noise at night in the winter when you're trying to sleep. So a pair of ear foam, foam earplugs can make a difference between you being able to get to sleep and just sitting there with your eyes open being freaked out all night. <laughs> so I recommend them. All right, my sleeping bag. So I'll take you through my journey. I started off with a hammock gear, zero degree wide down quilt. So this is a hammock top quilt that I was trying to take to the ground. Um, and let me say this, first of all, hammock gear makes fantastic stuff and their zero degree top quilt worked phenomenally for hammocking. But your sleep positioning and the equipment that you're using while you're hammocking in the winter is completely different. Uh, once you take that top quilt and try to use it as a sleeping bag, um, this might be controversial, but for me, uh, it did not work well. It didn't matter what I did, I ended up with drafts that caused me to be cold and interrupted my sleep all night long. Every time I rolled over, I would get a draft. It would wake me up. It was a nightmare. So I would not recommend top quilts for uh, winter camping. All right, so my next evolution was a Big Agnes Down Zero Degree Blackthorn UL sleeping bag. So I thought this was going to be the ticket for sure. Unfortunately, I froze in that sleeping bag. So long story short on that style of Big Agnes bag is that it was just too roomy inside. While it would be very comfortable for three seasons camping, for winter camping, you want a very form-fitting sleeping bag. A mummy style is definitely the way to go, which led me to my final winter sleeping bag selection this Nemo I believe it was the Sonic Zero and this is a zero degree down sleeping bag and I can personally testify that that is going to be the comfort rating of this bag is zero so there's there's survival transition and comfort ratings that's definitely something to be aware of with sleeping bags you want a bag with a comfort rating that's going to be in the temperature area that you're going to be operating in um, and this was definitely more of a form-fitting design. Um, you can see that it has a ton of loft, which is exactly what you're after for a winter bag. You want a lot of um, beefy, lofty down to keep you warm. And then um, the design features, other than the mummy cut that really helped out with this sleeping bag, are the draft collar on it. This actually has a double draft collar so these two tubes are filled up with down and they smush together when you zip the bag shut and it keeps cold air from infiltrating the sleeping bag through the zipper um, that's clutch and then another key feature is this draft collar so this collar has a cinch cord that opens and closes it's velcroed so you, when you get into the bag, you fasten the Velcro here, like that, and then you cinch it down around your neck. So 
This keeps all the hot air that your body is working so hard to create from exiting the sleeping bag out your hood. It just locks it into the sleeping bag. That's another really key feature of a good winter bag is a good draft collar that locks the heat in. And then, of course, a gr another great feature is, of course, when you got those draft tubes like that, they're kind of um, a little fussy on the zip-up. They're always going to want to snag on you. That's just something you got to deal with. But the, uh, the last feature you're looking for is a, a really good fitting hood. So you want this hood to be able to open up in warmer weather, to be comfortable, and then cinch down to just a tiny little hole for you to breathe out of when it gets really cold. That's going to also help to lock that heat in. Snow makes good toilet paper. Not the icy kind, the soft, fresh kind. The only downside though, in winter, it's a little bit harder to dig your cat hole because the ground's frozen. Water. So, just go with a uh, smart water bottle because it works with my um, filtration system that I use for summer, which is the Sawyer Squeeze. And um, here's the deal. You could bring an insulated water bottle, uh, but that's going to be a huge weight penalty. And for the conditions that I was hiking in, which were very often below freezing, I didn't have a whole bunch of problems with my canteen water freezing. Because first of all, you're constantly hiking, so the movement uh, slows the freezing process down. And the few times that it did start slushing up on me, um, I just dump it at the next water source and refill it. Um, if I want it to slow down that process, because it was an extremely cold, windy day, uh, that's when I would bust out one of my uh, one of my wool socks. And as another advantage of the smart water bottle is that they fit right into these wool socks beautifully, just like that. And uh, shove that into my pack. That slows down the freezing process. So. That's my winter hack for keeping my water liquid while I'm hiking. Um, at the end of the day, once you got into camp, you just had to dump your water when you were going to sleep because if you didn't, it was going to be frozen. I did not bring water into my sleeping bag with me. I know there's some guys that will advocate for uh, bringing a Nalgene bottle for just that purpose because you can pour boiling water into it and bring it into your sleeping bag before you go to sleep to help keep you warm. Um, to me, the risk outweighed the, uh, re the reward on that one. I was honestly terrified that um, I would get a leak, which would be completely catastrophic if I got wet in the night uh, out in the middle of nowhere on the trail. Um, you know, you're in deep trouble. So for me, I, I chose other methods like hot hands um, to keep myself warm if I needed an extra boost. So there's water. Clothing. So this is going to be extremely subjective. Everybody's body heats and cools differently. Um, I learned from experience that I guess I have a higher than normal tolerance to cold weather. So my advice might, might not be um, applicable to you, but maybe you'll gain some golden nugget out of this. Um, one thing I definitely recommend, I already talked about it, is those darn tough uh, mountaineering heavyweight wool socks. So... These things are worth their weight in gold on the trail, and I will never wear anything else in the winter. Um, I personally just paired them with a pair of trail runners. Um, I got the Morels or uh, Merrells. I don't know what the how you call them, but those things are fine for me, and I'll hike in any weather with them. Um, and then I don't wear a base layer on my legs while I'm hiking because I will just overheat. So I have a summer weight. Uh, I think these are Columbia Silver Ridge uh Summer weight hiking pants, flash dry. I'll wear that in the winter. And then my ex officio, the 9-inch give-and-go boxer briefs. Don't get the shorter ones. They might be cheaper. You save a couple of bucks. But these will help protect you from um, chub rub. And they do a pretty good job of um, repelling stink. So I've been sticking with the ex officios. And then up top, I just got my, um, I got a uh, lightweight merino wool long sleeve shirt or um, you could do a lightweight base layer uh, merino wool base layer polyester base layer whatever you prefer like i say i stick with the merino wool for stink um, stink protection but whatever works for you 
And that was pretty much my um, every day. That was going to be on me no matter what happened. And then I could add to that based on the weather. Um, in, the, uh, in the cargo pocket of my pants on either side, I would keep a mid-weight merino wool buff. So that would um, work as either a hat or neck protection or even go up over my nose and face if it was extremely cold and windy. Definitely a necessity. Um, I would have a pair of uh, military wool glove liners. So those did a good job keeping my hands warm. Um, I, I don't have it here, but... Oh, yeah, I do. Here it is. Also in my pocket would be a merino wool um, watch cap. So this is also made by Mara Wool. That thing worked phenomenal. Kept my head very toasty warm. It's, it's extremely thin and lightweight. And then these here are um, actually waterproof, windproof um, glove shells. And they are made by Enlightened Equipment. They weigh like next to nothing. But um, they're going to keep your hands dry and... Uh, Windproof. So, I guess uh, the only thing I, that there's room to improve on with this equipment is the gloves and the glove shells. Um, I just wish there was a way that I could operate my phone and have some dexterity but still keep my hands warm. So, um, in the future, I might be looking to replace that glove setup with something that um, maybe has... Uh, the fingers that will operate your, you know, you're hiking along and you want to videotape something or you want to place a phone call, you want to listen to some music, um, whatever you're doing with your phone, I would have to take my gloves off um, and your, my hands would ice up. I actually got some frost nip and a couple of fingers just trying to do stuff like that. So um, that's one improvement that I could make on my system. Um, if it was at all windy or a little bit colder, I would add this enlightened equipment, um, I forget, I think it's called a Copperfield wind shirt. thing weighs like, I don't know, maybe three ounces. And that makes a huge difference in how warm I stayed while I was hiking. It provided the ideal level of warmth and comfort um, most of the time. That's all I would be wearing. Um, can't recommend that highly enough. That wind shirt is worth its weight in gold. Uh, it just creates a little micro environment around you. It stops the wind from stripping the heat off you. And in a lot of in a lot of cases where I probably would have been wearing wearing a heavier uh, middle weight layer, that thing sufficed. So I love that. And then for my puffy, I also went with the lightened equipment, and this is their Apex uh, insulated torrid jacket. So again. Um, Great piece of kit, great warmth to weight ratio, and what I liked about it was that it's not down. Um, I did not want to have to worry about getting my down puffy jacket wet while I was out in the field and it not keeping me warm and not being able to dry it out. So that completely eliminated that concern, and in my opinion, it's just as light, if not lighter than a down jacket, and uh just as warm. So that was my uh, puffy layer. And I also, you saw my mid layer earlier. I also brought along some Z Packs rain pants. So that's another three ounce item that uh, makes a huge difference if it's windy out. And my summer weight hiking pants just aren't cutting it. Uh, break these things out, slide them right over the top, and boom, um, you're warm again. And I also have uh, some gaiters, z pack gaiters, again, only a couple ounces, but um, I mostly use those if I was traveling through uh, snow, you know, all the way up to knee deep. Um, it would just keep the snow from getting inside of my trail runners um, and keep my, you know, add a little bit of water resistance and warmth to uh, my lower legs when I was plowing through snow. So that is pretty much all the clothing, you know, other than my mid-layer mid that I will bring. 
All right, so where could my clothing improve? Um, I would like to pick up a pair of down pants and maybe some down camp booties. So basically there's that time frame when you finish hiking and you're hanging around camp doing whatever you're doing. And it would be nice to be comfortable and not getting hypothermic in that time frame between arriving at camp and getting into your sleeping bag. So that's where those two clothing items would help out a lot. Let's say you're cooking dinner and you know, you're sitting there eating or you want to hang out with some friends or whatever you're doing, hanging your bear bag, brushing your teeth, whatever you're doing before you go to bed. Um, that's when you throw those items on, you know, you get out of your soaking wet um, socks and shoes and your wet trail clothes and you put on this, those down pants over your long johns and your, you know, your nice warm down booties with some fresh dry socks before you go to bed. And, and you know, you're, you're able to hang out. It extends your, your time to enjoy being outside your sleeping bag as opposed to just being on this like crazy mission to get everything done before you ice up. So that's, uh, that's me from experience there. Here's an item that I fretted a lot over before I went on my first long distance winter hike. Micro spikes. So um, maybe some of you guys are on the fence about it or you're researching. I'm just going to clear it all up for you. Yes, bring them. If you're going into the mountains in the winter, bring micro spikes. Um, my experience is that the conditions at elevation are going to be radically different than they are on the uh, valley floor where you start hiking. And uh, you can expect an icy trail. So I should mention that some of you guys are probably in New Hampshire or out in the Rockies or something. And you're going to be bringing a lot more clothing layers and probably an ice axe and some snowshoes and, you know, really next level winter camping gear so the stuff that i'm talking about is more for um temperate uh winter hiking don't forget the lip balm you're definitely going to want to bring that and i keep mine in with my toothpaste and toothbrush and um all that stuff gets hung in my bear bag at night because it smells like food and the last thing you want is a bear coming into your uh, tent or wherever because uh, you forgot to put your chapstick away so that brings up another point uh, that's critical to winter camping, and that's that you have to have a routine. And you have to religiously follow it, because the last thing you want to do is get into your sleeping bag, you know, change into your dry clothes, get into your sleeping bag, and then realize, oh, i got to hang my bear bag, and it's a blizzard outside. Or, oh, I forgot to brush my teeth, my toothpaste is in my bear bag. Uh, anything like that. So um, little mistakes cause big problems in the winter time. Forgetting to empty your water bottle before you go to sleep. Uh, and any any little routine item that you overlook is going to hurt you. So just before you go to sleep, make sure you run through your checklist in your mind. You got everything done, and be methodical when you're going about your breakdown and um, setup routine. Uh, because, you know, like, like I say, you know, the, the temperature makes it so that you got to get everything done relatively quickly and efficiently. You can't have your gloves off for too long while you're pulling your tent stakes out. All that stuff's got to be done quickly. So um, that's the, another piece of advice I can give you. All right, sleeping quarters. So uh, in my experience, we're talking about sleeping in the trail shelters on the Appalachian Trail, hammocking or uh, tenting. And I've done them. I've done it all. Um, so, as far as sleeping in the trail shelters go, um, people say they're colder, but in my opinion, um, that's my favorite. I just love the extra room they afford, and um, you know, I could spread all my gear out. Uh, I could stand up. I could get dressed. I could do whatever in there. I love that. Um, and generally, in the winter time, um, I'll get to a shelter and I'll have it to myself especially during the week. Uh, if there's other people there, then um, I definitely prefer having my own sleeping uh, space. I'll set up a tent or hammock or whatever. Um, hammocks, I got a great winter hammock set up. Um, I love hammocking. I think it's way more comfortable than um, sleeping on the ground and prefer it. Um, 
The only thing you got to be leery about with a hammock is that tarp that goes over the top of your hammock is like a giant wind sail. So uh, you get those winter winds that come through and you better have that thing really uh, battened down. And I'm talking about like tent stake selection is critical. You need some huge tent stakes. And uh, I noticed from experience that thing will blow right off in the middle of the night while it's raining and uh, you're in a heap of trouble then. So, so tent stakes and making sure that your tarp is secured well. And then the second issue is that uh, once you go with a hammock and you get out in the woods, you're committed to it. Um, generally, you're going to have an under quilt and not a sleeping pad. So um, that's it, man. It doesn't matter what it's doing out there. If there's uh, 40 mile an hour winds and trees are snapping in half, you're going to be sleeping in your hammock. You can't go to the shelter because you don't have a sleeping pad. So, you know, on an extended trip, that's something to think about. You might want to take a good look at the weather and make sure you don't have any winter storms coming through because you're wearing it in your hammock if, uh, if that happens. And then tents. Um, there's a big single wall, double wall uh, debate out there. Um, my opinion on that is if you get a good single wall tent, uh, condensation is not going to be an issue for you. I have a Z-Pax duplex, never had a condensation issue, and I've used that thing in every imaginable weather condition. Um, so I can, I can recommend a single wall duplex. Um, the only thing I can say is all this advice I'm giving is for like temperate weather conditions. So we're talking about like six inches or less of snowfall, um, you know, less than a foot of snow on the ground. If you're going to be like pulling into an area that's got eight feet of snow on the ground and you're expecting a foot of snow, you're probably going to want a um, freestanding tent. And I don't have a whole lot of experience in that area. Um, I've only had one in my life and it was heavy as hell and uh, I didn't have that thing long. So there's my uh, breakdown on living accommodations. So that brings us to the end of our video. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe if you dig the content I'm putting out. But um, I would say the moral of the story with this video is going to be efficiency. Um, and you could kind of the last point I'm going to bring up here is the layout of your pack. Uh, with that in mind, you want to have everything that you're going to need throughout the day either on your person or immediately accessible because you just can't fiddle around too much in the winter. Your bricks are going to be kept pretty short um, with the exception of that added uh, clothing, the down pants and the down, camp, the down camp booties, which would definitely extend your ability to be able to hang out at the end of the day. Um, if it's down in the 20s or below, you're going to be uh, pushed into your sleeping bag relatively quickly. But... Um, you can see here, this is my uh, poncho. It's in a um, Gossamer Gear feed bag right up front. So I'm going to have to stop, take off my backpack, get out my poncho, put my backpack back on, put the poncho on, boom. I just pull it right out of that bag, throw it over me. When it stops snowing or raining, I tuck it right back in on the move. Um, here's my phone pouch, same deal. It's all about efficiency. I don't have to stop and fool around. Boom, pull the phone right out. Food. Right in these two bags here, um, you know, I'm getting right to it. My sit pad, boom, right there. Take it out, deploy it, put it back real quick. Um, so it's all about, um, you know, knowing your layout and being efficient while you're operating so that um, you don't get chilled. Generally, while I was moving on the trail, I stayed, I stayed relatively warm. I was comfortable. It's when you stop, um, that's where it gets challenging with winter camping. All right, in conclusion, I'd say that uh, winter camping is definitely my favorite kind of camping. Um, the vistas are definitely going to be the best. The best views, hands down, of any season. Um, you're going to be hiking uh, down sections of the trail that in, the, in any other season you would have no view at all, and it's going to be a blowout, uh, wide open view in the winter. Um, I like that there's less people on the trail, so less uh, distractions that way. Uh, I have uh, more solitude. It's a completely different vibe. I mean, you really have to experience it. Uh, you don't know what you're missing. Uh, no bugs, no snakes. Um, and uh, less less sweaty. You know, like you pull into camp at the end of the day and you're not a grimy mess. Like you feel pretty clean getting into your sleeping bag. So I enjoy that too. Of course, there's some downsides to uh, winter camping. I think we covered that. 
uh, we covered those challenges in this video. I hope you enjoyed the video. Again, don't forget to thumbs up and like it. And I hope you guys have a good one.